All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Our first speaker is Ada Athanasopoulos. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Ada is the Associate Professor uh, at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. Go Berkeley. Mm -hmm. uh, and she is uh, has a research focus and expertise on assessing and mitigating the impact of multi-hazard stressors on geotechnical engineering infrastructure. So we're going to hear a lot about exactly what that is. Mm -hmm. Ada, take us away, please. Yes, of course. Um, thank you uh, very much for this introduction and um, the invitation to join. Um, I have found that it, it's getting more and more exciting for me to join discussions with um, non-civil um, and environmental engineers or non-geotech engineers because I've been really enjoying the different perspectives and just hearing about sustainability from, from uh, people who are in different fields. So this is very exciting. Um, so let me go ahead and um, share my screen and then pull up my presentation. And then if you can just confirm that um, you're seeing it, uh, that'd be great. So I can proceed. Looks great. Looks um, people who are in different fields. So this okay. Is um, I am getting a little bit of a voice feedback, but hopefully that's not happening for you. Uh, let me know if the sound is not correct. Um, Good to go. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so um, as, um, as you mentioned, I'm an associate professor at, at UC Berkeley in the C department, and a thread of my research involves looking at the performance of levee systems. So levee is basically part of flood protection systems in various parts of the country. And here I just have two images from two recent hurricanes that, um, not recent, uh, two hurricanes that both affected the same area um, in Southeast Louisiana. And I um, had the honor of uh, being part of a reconnaissance, um, field reconnaissance teams that visited the affected areas in both cases. In 2005, I was still a graduate student at Cal, uh, but then uh, recently after Hurricane Ida uh, as a faculty member. Um, the reason I bring up these events is because the specific area has received a lot of attention and various upgrades to the system, as we're going to see. And so there was um, some focus on what the effect of these measures was, uh, given the very, very steep price tag. So something that makes um, dealing with these systems really challenging is that they can be affected by many different failure modes. Um, and um, as we see from these pictures, those things can vary from extreme events that can create winds and waves and erosion um, to basically water um, internally uh, compromising the levees through seepage and piping mechanisms. Um, the levees can be overtopped, uh, again, following severe hurricane and flood events. But at the same time, we also have what we call the sunny day uh, failures, um, which are basically the sudden unexpected levee failures due to aging and other um, reasons that would compromise the stability. As I mentioned from my opening slide, um, we have been comparing these two specific events because they were um, events that were 16 years apart to the day uh, and affected uh, pretty much the same area with the same type of loading. One of the biggest differences, of course, has been the upgrade and that the levee system and the flood protection system in New Orleans and surrounding areas has received. And so we see the difference uh, that um, such a robust system can make on what the effects can be of um, very, very strong hurricanes. Now, granted, obviously, uh, the hurricane did not have landfall at the exact same point, but I think the point is that um, we can, uh, engineering has a lot of solutions that can help us definitely prevent and, and minimize deaths. Um, obviously, one death is, is one too many, but uh, keeping the number really, really low in these extreme events. But we still see that the losses in terms of the um, money spent to recover are still significant. And also, we're still not able to make these systems perform um, well in terms of the impact that one uh, component of a system has on another. So in this case, even though flooding um, was not as intense as it was following Katrina, the big story uh, following this event was the collapse of one of the electricity transmission towers that left more than a million people without power for more than a week. 
Now, to kind of bring it closer to home, I have also focused at looking at levees in California. We see on the right um, hand side the figure showing the vast extent of the levees that we have in California. Uh, there's thousands of miles of levees. And if we focus more specifically in the Delta region, which is where the big two rivers um, converge uh, and all the islands exist that are protected by levees, we have about 1,100 miles of levees. Now, the Delta is significantly uh, important um, because as sea level rise uh, increases, um, increases the Delta salinity, that means that we require extra Delta outflow so that we don't um, get the salinity increase in the freshwater supply. And this has is coming, of course, at the expense of Delta exports and, and water basically taken from other places to support this extra outflow that's needed. And so in addition to this impact by climate change that's controlling a lot of the hydrodynamics and the flow around the Delta, here in California, which is not present in Louisiana, we also have the threat of a very severe seismic event. Um, and so specifically, some older studies and even more recently confirmed that there is about half a percent per year chance of an earthquake that would destroy enough levees that the repairs would take at least two to five years. And I think putting the timing is also important because if you're not able to um, upgrade and fix your system, then you're vulnerable to other events that will come along the way. Now, in learning, um, as I mentioned in the title of my presentation, kind of learning some lessons from the past and the work that we've done in the investigations of the performance of such systems under extreme events, some of the things that we have realized following Katrina is how complex and interconnected these systems are. And so when we're looking at levees, we really have to look at levees and the transportation system and the electrical grid system, and then also overlay information about communities and how they respond, uh, what is their access to um, health systems, to healthcare, um, to other important utilities. And we need to design with the system with all of these components in mind. And so we really need to bring everybody to the table rather than have geotechnical engineers take care of the geotechnical part and, you know, the other engineers take part of the other part and then the social science is being separated. We really need to bring everybody together. Another big thing that came up after Katrina that is still um, the case in some locations when I revisited the areas following Hurricane Ida is that um, it's, it's really difficult to make sure that we have access to all of these locations that are critical in these systems. So in the upper left corner, I show a picture of the current conditions of how close there is houses and private property basically uh, close to the toe of these levee systems, these embankments basically that are there to protect us against flooding. These structures, because of how complex they are and um, how they change because of various factors need to be frequently inspected. Um, and yet we see that this access is a big issue when we have private property extend all the way to the toe of these levees. And of course, this brings up the issue of, um, you know, you don't want to displace uh, communities. It is very difficult to tell someone that you need to take part of their property. And so we need to come up with more creative solutions to first not allow for this to happen in the future, of course, in any new locations, but then to find, um, as I said, creative, but also uh, equitable solutions uh, to address such situations. I mentioned the really steep price tag of this uh, reinforced system that New Orleans and the surrounding areas now have, which worked exactly as expected following Hurricane Ida. And so, as I mentioned before, there are solutions. Of course, they require large investments. Um, you know, we've been all talking and hearing about infrastructure bill and, and whatnot. Um, and I think it's really important to realize how um, expensive these solutions can be. Not all areas and communities will have access, therefore, to such resources. And so I think this is always something that we need to keep in mind um, as we're navigating these problems so that we can have equitable distribution. Uh, it's important also, you know, when we look at how we deal with um, other parts of critical infrastructure compared to, for example, flood protection in certain areas. And, and when you see charts like this, which um, just compare different things, um, this is not the intent to um, compare lives to, uh, to uh, money lost, but it's just to bring all the components together for the various projects. 
and just basically demonstrate how different some of these flood protection systems are in terms of the probability, um, so how likely they are to occur versus uh, the lives lost and also the um, the damages in terms of, of dollars. And the, the other thing that should concern us is that a lot of the events that we've been dealing with, that we've been calling 100-year events, are now happening almost every other summer. And so the frequency is definitely increasing given the climate change. Uh, and so we can look at uh, across the country uh, in many, many locations where we are going back to really uh, better understand and investigate these systems because the flood protection uh, that the systems are offering is not necessarily what we think it has been. And we need to adjust it and also better communicate that to the public as new development continues to happen uh, along these river cities. Other important questions to answer is, as I mentioned, the timeline. So if you have a failure, how quick can you repair it? Will you have resources available? Or for example, are they caught up because of something else that has been happening at the same time? And therefore, how do we manage that risk? We need to look at our systems now, just not individually from how they're being stressed, but how everything now that's coming together, um, we have existing stressors, what is the impact? So for example, we saw that after Hurricane Ida and some other events that a lot of people could not be evacuated from one hospital or clinic to another because the hospital was already uh, over uh, capacity because of COVID. Um, we see a lot of resources going to wildfires and, and fighting that, that you may not therefore have available for another event when it takes place. And of course, as we're talking every day that goes by, the infrastructure continues to age. And then if we add that future environmental conditions and climate change, as I mentioned before, uh, there is a huge impact in the long term. And the problem is that there is a huge cost in the short term. And this is really problematic when you're trying to convince people who have the power to make these decisions. Um, you need to spend a lot of resources up front so that you don't have something happen in 30 or 50 years from now. And as we know, when it comes to political will, unfortunately, the time window tends to be, uh, you know, follows election cycles and not 30 or 50 year uh, cycles. So very quickly for the last part of my talk, I will just show some things that we have been doing in our, in our group that we feel could contribute. And one thing that we feel is really important when we're investigating these systems is to understand the condition that they're in or the health monitoring part um, of the equation, as we call it. And with these systems, the big challenge is how spatially distributed they are. As I mentioned, there's thousands and thousands of these levees. And so it's really difficult to inspect them um, by having people walk or, or drive through them. And so we've been trying to leverage advances in technology. So using drones to develop these 3D models, the model that you see spinning at the bottom right of your screen is a, is a 3D point cloud, as we call them. So every point on that model, it has basically uh, coordinates associated with it. So I can do all sorts of things, um, measure it, uh, cut cross sections through it, compare it uh, from year to year and so forth. Um, and so we've been looking uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to jump to the field applications, but we've been looking at combining different uh, types of measurements like optical cameras with infrared cameras that show us changes in temperature that we can relate to changes in moisture conditions and identify uh, points that uh, are showing distress so that then we can be smarter about which sites we uh, visually uh, inspect versus just all of them. And so we have had various applications of these methods to show that we can really make it work. Um, and then uh, for my final slide, again, just to reemphasize that once we know what the system looks like and we can overlay information about upcoming um, hazards like seismic risk or severe flood events, it's really important to always combine that with land use, population data, and a lot of other information that were mentioned in some of the earlier presentations so that we always have the human aspect in mind when we're treating these systems and trying to make them uh, more um, both sustainable and, and resilient, of course, which I think kind of goes hand in hand. And so with that, I'll just acknowledge some collaborators and um, funding sources, um, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ada. That was a wonderful presentation. I alone have plenty of questions for you. Uh, so we'll get into those at the end. I would now like to uh, introduce Peter.
Peter is the CEO of Net Impact, and he is an impact investor, educator, and as I mentioned, CEO of Net Impact, where over 160,000 members uh, have a mission to inspire, equip, and activate emerging leaders to bring a positive change to the world's most pressing challenges. Peter, take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marjorie. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I have no slides and my presentation is not particularly technical. It comes from a front line of the discussion with NextGen and where I think the narrative is moving. Uh, as described, Net Impact is, a, we're a 29 year nonprofit with this mission to inspire, equip, and now activate emerging leaders for a just and sustainable world. We do that through programs and fellowships and uh, challenges and other forms of activations and events. Uh, we're about 430 chapters around the world. They're on most major college campuses, undergrads, grads, and professional chapters in most major cities around the country, around the world, uh, uh, around the world with the fastest growing community in continental Africa. Um, it's a very interesting moment that we're in because uh, just as the U.S. Business Roundtable redefined a corporation as caring about broad stakeholdership back in the summer of 2019, suggesting that we all as people, the communities where businesses operate uh, are ratable with uh, supply chain and with uh, investors rather than Milton Friedman's old shareholder primacy that the, the business of business is to create profit solely. Um, it suggests a level of agency that people have. And one of the things I'm here to talk about is that where we sit at Net Impact as sort of a market sensing organization sensitive to our community, but uh, also nudging business in the direction of good. Um, business is our single largest partner in the activations we, we forge together. Um, NextGen is not just insisting on the agency that is their right, just as social contract declares that, or, you know, a pun, you know, historians once talked about the social contract between the state and people. Uh, there's a social contract between business and people. And, uh, and, and NextGen is taking that up. We're seeing it in terms of their civic engagement. We're seeing it in terms in the last 60 days, uh, how they're taking up the charge to say that the narrative that say is created at COP is not necessarily authentic, isn't doing enough, that there are not exponential outcomes built into that and that we don't have 30 years to wait uh, as a generation for the world's most vexing problems to be solved. Ours is a community that inherits a planet with problems not of their own creation, and they're insisting on an opportunity to address them. Terrific opportunity, terrific work. Um, but I'd also like to say that there's a certain grimness in the discussion as we transition who owns this narrative to a youthful community that is insisting on agency. There's a grimness in the old message that, and you hear it, I'm not, I won't name names, but you attend events and you'll hear luminaries in the do good space talk about that they've never been more pessimistic, that we need to put one foot ahead of the other, but that it's not an easy thing and we don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. We need to do what we can. There's a sort of grimness and, and doomism in that messaging. And next gen community does not feel that way. What they're insisting upon is an opportunity to affect change. Uh, and they have that sense of urgency. We're, we're doing it net impact now in terms of how we communicate the messaging is that the work must require a level of joy, that there is that we must be happy warriors and the opportunities to narrow the racial wealth gap, to address climate uh, crisis, as, as Paul Hawken in his last book said, in one generation, there are things that can be done and our community believes that. Our organization feels that we can narrow the gap between academics and practitionership for our next gen community and put them in positions of authority 
in business. Uh, you know, as uh, Professor Zeko said, you know, there are the, you know, influencing the people that make the decision. I think there's a real challenge right now when you see next gen Acosta CEOs on TED Talk stages or or uh, march at COP and scoff at uh, scoff at the incrementalism that's happening there. Uh, articles and letters written to their to the employer uh, at ad firm uh, Edelman to uh, to to drop uh, fossil fuel clients and others like uh, McKinsey. There is a there's a form of activism. There's a frontier in the do good space. And I would say that net impact is not at that frontier, but it has within its community those that feel that they are they, that we need to drive business to be a force for good. But there are those that will say that enough's enough and we need to create exponential change. And the way to do that is to demand that now. So one of the things I'm really curious about and think that in the landscape of probabilities, all probabilities add up to 100, it may be a low probability that our community, who is a believer in business is a force for good, students shouldn't have to sacrifice values for a paycheck, uh, that they still are interested in sitting in the seats of large public companies and driving change. But the narrative is moving from that central position that I want to forge personal purpose in the workplace. Uh, we are the first generation that can, all of us, those that are living, can, can assert purpose in the workplace. Um, this community is moving slightly in the direction of the activists that will say, well, wholesale industries need to end. And I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. That's not where net impact is, but it is a it's an honest assessment of the landscape of next gen that there is a community, a, a component of our community that believes that way. What I'm really excited about, just as we'll hear the world weary pundit say, I've never been more pessimistic, but we need to put one foot ahead of the other. I'm really excited about our community that has the ambition to be in the position to affect change. And it's our job to provide them both the tools for that and the forum to amplify their voices and those that are underrepresented or marginalized that haven't historically been heard. That's the good work that I think Net Impact has done over the last two years is to, to look where this narrative is and where it's going and, and to be at that frontier. So I think that our community, our Net Impact community, 160,000 boots on the ground is interested in nudging business as a force for good and at, for the first time, we all can work for companies we're proud of, drive change at those companies, consume in ways that meet our personal purpose, and invest money that way as well. And in some ways, therefore, we are the first because we are all, you know, I have many miles on me, so I'll add myself to the generation that is finding their way to work just because I can still work. We are the first generation that can have this complete harmony in the way we do those various things. And I have great optimism that that's going to affect change. Uh, at Net Impact this year, our theme is the regenerative economy. All the work we do is, is through that lens. And our work is informed by the three pillars that our community cares about most. And we have a bead on that, on where our community is. The community cares about, it, you know, one pillar or vertical is social justice and civic engagement. Uh, another pillar is climate and environment. And the third is responsible finance and investing. The, the beauty of that intersectionality is that ours is a community that is seeing that they have the agency to make change at the ballot box, to make change with consumption, to make change while they work for companies, to make change in how they invest. And the, the work we're doing under those three pillars, climate, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, responsible finance and investing, um, are all in sort of in the mission to um, activate our emerging leader to drive a just and sustainable planet. Um, I'm very optimistic that our community is finding its way into the workplace and is going to drive change. I think there can be real dislocation 
over the next year or so as not so gently perhaps next gen insists on increasingly insists on agency and not all institutions are prepared to hand that over i think that isn't just a generational thing i i think uh, it's about marginalized people as well that uh that marginalized people worldwide are insisting on agency and increasingly must listen to those voices so I'm very optimistic about this, but I do think that it, it could get a, a little rough over the course of the next year for, for business as they have entreaties to really walk the talk. One of the things about the business roundtable is redefinition of a corporation to include broader stakeholdership is that there's likely to be a heightened level of shareholder engagement to try to hold business to the standards that they're representing in their sustainability reports that they want to keep. And I genuinely believe in all the businesses that we work with, that they are on this journey and they are in different places. And so long as a business is on their journey in the direction of good, we want to, we want to support that. Um, and, and so we believe in this notion that in the world of say, I'll be simplistic in here in, in this way I describe this in this world where there is simply good or bad, that, that bad is sort of uniform in their responses without needing to check in with one another. And good is disparate, dysfunctional, often egotistical. And some of what net impact is trying to forge in the notion of the joy in the work to be that happy warrior is in sort of the shared mission that we have with all people and with all organizations, not just nonprofits, public companies too, that there is <clears throat> in the do good space, there is room for the activists, there's room for uh, civil society, there's room for public companies on their journey to good. And that we need to sort of work in unity to get from here to there because bad surely is unified and, uh, and good needs to be as well. So some of the things that we've done, we've recently formed an alliance with a group called Good Worldwide uh, which is a B Corp for profit to uh, be sort of as best we can become a bigger juggernaut in the do good space. And, and I think that that's some of walking the talk on nudging business in the direction of good is coming with more formidable tools to help them get there. I think it's inexorable. One in three dollars invests through an ESG lens. Ours is a generation that will download a sustainability report, 89% of them will, before they take an interview for a job. They'll take a 10% or 15% pay cut to work for businesses that they're proud to work for. And they inherit $68 trillion of wealth intergenerationally over the next 20 years. So they will be businesses, shareholders, communities where they operate, consumers, and employees. I'm very optimistic about the direction things can go in. And I think ours is the challenge to uh, hasten change and provide the tools to a next generation to make change. Thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, you know, a lot of us uh, people and groups are doing such amazing work. And I think that that is really illustrated by the level of participation uh, at the symposium, both in speakers and those that are attending. So thank you so much for that message. Um, and I know that there are probably people that might have questions. So if you can enter those in the Q&A box, that would be fantastic. And then we'll uh, circle back to Q&A at the end. I would like to now introduce Sarah Miro. Sarah is uh, an interdisciplinary social and ecological system scientist. Uh, working at the intersection of urban geography and planning. She's an assistant professor at the School of Geographical Science and Urban Planning at Arizona State University. Welcome, Sarah. Great. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, and I know it's not... Uh, oh, wait, hold on. Is it showing... Not showing my screen with PowerPoint. That's fine. Um, <laughs> here, let's see. Uh, are you seeing my 
we dashboard. All right. There we now go. Now you see it, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, so yes, thank you uh, for the introduction. I don't think I need to say much more about myself. Um, I'm yeah, a professor at Arizona State University. And today um, I'm going to be talking about some of my recent work, which has really been focusing on the issue of how we plan for extreme heat. Um, and so you can hear me see everything fine before I jump in. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, could I get a verbal verbal? Yes. Yeah, it looks fine. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, okay. So, you know, I think at this point, no matter where you are currently, um, you probably notice that it's getting hotter. Um, you know, 2010 to 2019 was the hottest decade on record and 2020 was the hottest. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Was the hottest year. Um, so, you know, why should we be concerned about this? Um, besides that, maybe it's a little bit uncomfortable, right? Well, for starters, heat kill. Um, it's the deadliest weather related disaster. Um, where I am in Maricopa County, Arizona, heat deaths have been on the rise. As you can see from this graph here, um, there were more than 300 heat deaths in 2020, um, which really shattered previous records. Um, but there are also other impacts of heat, right? To quality of life, the economy, water, energy use, uh, ecosystem. So, you know, even communities that haven't traditionally really had to worry uh, that much about heat really now have to. I mean, just look at what happened last summer um, with in the Pacific Northwest, right? Um, so, you know, this sort of realization really led uh, my colleague at the University of Arizona, uh, Professor Lad Keith, and I to try and assess, well, what is the current state of heat planning, right? So heat is this kind of um, invisible hazard. It has, you know, traditionally not really been regulated to the same extent as other hazards, such as um, flooding, as you know, uh, we heard about in the first presentation. And so we weren't, we're not really sure, well, how much are communities actually preparing and uh, addressing heat? So what we did was we conducted a survey um, asking planners in communities across the country about their concerns for heat, what impacts they're seeing in their communities, uh, the different information sources um, that they're using or what information they feel they need about heat, uh, what kind of strategies they're implementing to try and address it in what plans, um, and then what sort of barriers they're facing in really trying to scale up their heat efforts uh, you know, in the face of a changing climate. Um, so we conducted this survey on two samples um, with the goal of really trying to provide a comprehensive sort of baseline assessment of heat planning across the US. Um, so the one I'll focus on in presenting some of the results uh, are is a stratified random sample of communities uh, of different sizes and from different climate regions across the US. Um, and we sent the survey to uh, sort of high level planners in each of these cities. Um, and we had a total of 69 uh, different cities that responded. We also had a, a more convenient sample of nearly 100 planning professionals. And the results were fairly similar. Um, but again, I'll focus on this representative one because I really wanna see you know, what, what really is the, the more realistic uh, status of heat planning. So uh, thinking about heat concern, um, big takeaway here, the majority of planners indicated that they were at least somewhat to very concerned about extreme heat overall, as well as to the economic, environmental, and health impacts specifically. Um, planners noted that they were most concerned about impacts to the environment and public health, um, a little less so those economic impacts. And most planners were concerned, uh, or more planners were concerned about climate change as a contributor to uh, heat more so than the urban heat island, because we know that in cities, uh, heat is caused, or, or rising temperatures are caused both um, by global climate change, as well as uh, characteristics of the built environment, which ultimately lead uh, many cities to be hotter than surrounding areas or than they were um, in sort of pre-development states uh, due to more impervious surfaces and waste heat. So what are the heat impacts that communities are experiencing? Well, 
The big takeaway here is that more than 80% of these planners said that their communities were being impacted in some way already by heat. Um, the top five most commonly reported impacts were to energy and water use, urban vegetation, public health, quality of life. Um, so those were the top five. And you know, we see that sort of on the other side, retail and economic development were less commonly reported impacts. Now, what kind of information are planners using um, when it comes to heat? So over 70% said that they use some sort of heat information in planning. Um, the most common were vegetation maps or tree maps. Uh, they use the heat index um, and historical temperature data. We didn't see uh, as much use of future scenarios. Um, we also asked planners whether they were not using information because uh, they didn't think it would be useful or because they didn't have access to it. And we feel that these, you know, the information sources that they say they're not using because they don't have access to, that's really an opportunity, right, for climate service providers to actually fill these gaps and uh, help to, you know, or other organizations to help give this information to communities. Um, now, planners said that those biggest gaps were in the future scenarios, land surface temperature maps, um, air temperature data, and heat vulnerability maps. So again, these are places where, you know, maybe researchers or climate service providers could, could help to uh, provide communities with helpful information. Um, now, planning for heat involves, uh, we we've, are, would argue, involves both mitigating heat in the built environment, trying to address that urban heat island through strategies like reducing uh, that reduce waste heat, uh, add vegetation, or alter the urban de uh, design or land uses. Um, so there's these heat mitigation strategies and also heat management, which is about how do you deal um, with heat events, right? Um, so this would be making sure that we reduce people's exposure, that you have emergency uh, preparedness and plans in place to try to address and cope with heat. Um, so this is the framework that we developed um, to try to think about what would a comprehensive approach to enhancing uh, heat resilience be, again, would include both heat mitigation and heat management. And traditionally, these have tended to be kind of separated and siloed, right? So, you know, maybe urban planners, designers dealing with the heat mitigation and, you know, emergency management offices much more focused on the heat management aspect or utilities potentially. So what are our strategies are communities implementing? Well, around 90%, um, so majority again said that they're implementing one or more of these strategies. The majority said urban forestry, emergency response strategies, weatherization, and man-made shade. Um, so these were implemented in the majority of communities um, and were the most commonly implemented strategies. On the other side, very few communities said that they actually had regulations or uh, dedicated staff to deal with heat. Um, and, you know, I think especially when it comes to things like regulations, right, we think that these might have a pretty big impact. So the fact that so few communities have that um, is, is potentially concerning as we think about uh, heat as, you know, becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Um, you know, unfortunately, planners also communicated that they feel there's a lot of barriers to really scaling up their heat planning efforts. Um, the most significant of those are really related to sort of human and financial resources, um, as well as political will. Um, but, you know, across the board, really all of the, the barriers that we, uh, you know, offered all of those options were seen as at least a slight barrier and most were seen as um, on average, somewhat of a barrier. So again, some definitely some, some barriers we need to overcome. Um, and we also asked, you know, what types of plans? So communities have lots of different plans and traditionally there haven't been dedicated heat uh, plans in very many communities. Um, so we see, well, where are they actually addressing heat? Um, and so over 65% of uh, the respondents said, the majority said that they were addressing heat in at least one type of plan, um, but there's quite a variation. So no one plan type uh, was addressing heat in the majority of communities. Um, so, for example, the highest, uh, most common was in a sustainability, climate action, or resilience plan, uh, then a general plan. Um, we were quite surprised to see that such a small minority of the planners said that they were addressing heat in their hazard mitigation plans, um, you know, which, uh, you know, we would think would be a, an obvious place where you might uh, try to address heat. So because we see that cities rarely have standalone heat plans um, and that they're integrated into these different plans, 
you know, it's really important that when we're thinking about, well, how are communities addressing heat or how should they address heat, that we try to think about their full network of plans, right? Because all of these different plans, a comprehensive plan, a transportation plan, a hazard mitigation plan, parks and recreation plan, all of them are going to ultimately shape the built environment, uh, shape, you know, veg the patterns of vegetation, and, uh, and therefore ultimately impact uh, heat risk in the community. And conversely, they have uh, they all have opportunities that could be taken to actually address heat in them. So we really need to think as we're thinking about heat planning, um, think about plans as a network. Um, so just to give an example of, of why that might matter. So, you know, a parks and recreation plan uh, might call for new green space, right? Uh, new parks um, that could really mitigate heat. Uh, similarly, say a climate action plan might call for solar, uh, new solar energy, which can help to provide shade for uh, parking or buildings, but also reduce waste heat um, or new vegetated roofs and walls, which uh, could also have a, a heat mitigation benefit. But then maybe conversely, a transportation plan could call for new surface parking lots or road expansions that would you know, really exacerbate uh, the urban heat island and potentially negate some of those cooling effects um, from other plans. So what this suggests is you know, that we really do need to, uh, you know, again, think about um, the collective impact of these different plans and try and, and ultimately coordinate them so we don't have you know, efforts to uh, address heat being negated by, by other planning efforts. So with um, some support from the NOAA Climate Program Office's Extreme Heat Risk Initiative, uh, my colleague who I also did that survey with, Lad Keith and I are currently working um, with Phil Burke, a researcher at UNC Chapel Hill, and the American Planning Association to really develop a step-by-step -step process that we can actually use to identify these sorts of contradictions in plans and to try to assess the various policies in community plans, such as you know, new development, um, increased density, or uh, added new green space that would ultimately affect heat um, in different parts of the city. Um, so this, what we're calling this uh, approach is the Plan Integration for Resilience Scorecard for Heat or PERSH. It builds on uh, another, uh, the original Plan Integration for Resilience Scorecard, which was developed uh, by Phil Burke and some of his colleagues for flooding, but really adapts it to heat. Um, what you do is you basically identify the different plans that are shaping land use and the built environment. Then you identify spatially explicit policies in those plans. You categorize and score them. Um, based on whether they would increase or reduce vulnerability to heat. And then you add up those scores to ultimately uh, figure out, you know, okay, what is the sort of combined effect of uh, proposed developments in these different plans on, on heat um, across the community? Um, and then you can compare these maps with other indicators and maps um, related to hazard exposure, uh, social vulnerability, et cetera, to try to understand, well, are plans, you know, targeting heat, uh, you know, in, in areas where it's most needed, or um, is it likely to exacerbate heat in areas that are, say, already uh, face a lot of heat exposure? Um, and so, yes, this, this work is, is ongoing. We're currently developing met methodology and piloting it in five cities across the U.S., Baltimore, Boston, Fort Lauderdale, Houston, um, and Seattle, and we'll be producing a uh, freely available guidebook um, on this, as well as we're also working on um, some more practical guidance through the American Planning Association. We'll be actually coming out with a report this spring that provides a lot more detail on you know how communities can actually plan for uh, for heat. So then finally, I just want to end um, with really calling for more attention on the issue of heat governance. Right. So I've talked about about planning, but I think we need to think also about how we're managing heat more broadly, how we're really governing it, right? So what are the actors, the strategies, the processes, and the institutions that are ultimately shaping uh, decision-making for both uh, heat mitigation and management? Um, and so some colleagues and I recently published actually a comment in Nature arguing um, for this and really outlining six principles for better heat governance. So what those were is we basically said that equity needs to be front and center because we know that heat risk currently um, is highly uneven, ha uh, heat impacts are highly uneven. We need to invest in both heat mitigation and management, which I've already talked about, 
Um, we need more consistent metrics um, for both of these goals, and we need to coordinate all of these initiatives um, so that heat management and mitigation aren't quite so siloed. Um, so if you're interested in more detail, uh, I would say go ahead and uh, read the full, full comment there. Um, all right, well, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. So thank you all of you, both uh, Ada, Peter, and Sarah for your presentations. Uh, if you all could come back on camera and then we can do just a few minutes of Q&A before our session. Um, I really wanted to try to think about, um, you know, where exactly can we start in terms of, um, implementing this sustain these sustainability practices, these plans, these resiliency plans, et cetera. And Ada, I wanted to start with you. Um, as you were speaking, I was really thinking about the benefit of repairing some locations, whether upstream or downstream first in order to lessen the impact on other parts of a system. Um, how exactly does a municipality go about uh, I guess, trying to prioritize which pieces they work on so as to make their work in a few years a little bit easier, maybe kind of an 80-20 rule kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's an excellent uh, question and a very important point and, and one that we're trying to hopefully, um, you know, improve upon because really the best way to do that is after fully understanding the vulnerability of your entire system. Uh, the risk that uh, failures in various locations impose upon anybody affected, and then prioritizing having those things in mind, right? So it shouldn't just be about uh, what is perhaps um, easier to fit into a, a timeline or what is cheaper, what is quicker to do, but it should be what can I fix given my resources that will have the most impact in terms of reducing risk um, throughout the entire system. And so that basically means that you really understand your system well. And I think when it comes to flood protection with levees, there's still some ways to go before we can really say that we have a handle over um, the a risk assessment for that entire system. And I think something that further complicates it is that there is really not one entity that is in charge of this entire system. Um, that's a little bit easier to do when you're looking, let's say, at a building or even at a dam for that matter. But when it comes to these um, systems, part of them are um, federally owned and, and managed. Others are privately owned and managed. Others are in some kind of a hybrid situation somewhere in between. Um, and so, you know, there is there's a lot of work to do to get all of the right people at the table and have everybody agree on specific um, guidelines, requirements, um, data collection, for example, so that we can get to that point. There was just a, a question that came up in the Q&A. Could you talk real quick about a case study um, of a dam failure? Yeah, so I, I think the um, the question referred to the Edenville um, dam failure that I showed that happened in uh, Michigan, and um, that was just an opportunity for us to um, deploy a lot of the methods that we're proposing to use for other locations as well. But um, this was a failure that the American Society of Civil Engineers recently um, published a report on the findings um, and a lot of the information we collected, um, and uh, it. The failure occurred uh, two days after intense precipitation, heavy rainfall. Um, and even though thankfully there were no um, human injuries or, or, or life loss, um, there were about, I think, close to 100 million in flood damages downstream that followed this event. And um, this is a dam, I should say, that was built in the 1920s. Very, very different uh, guidelines, specifications um, at the time. Material was deposited in fairly loose conditions, which contributed to this failure. And is described by engineers as, as an anomaly, really, and not something that we often see happen with these structures. Um, however, it is alarming because we do have um, other infrastructure that dates back to the 1920s. Excellent, excellent. And and Sarah, same question for you in terms of prioritization when, uh, when some of these plans are being rolled out in a community and getting stakeholders on the same page Exactly what does that look like uh, as far as implementation? What really are 
all of the pieces of the puzzle that need to be uh, brought together in order to make that first move in a community with a heat plan? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think similar to what, uh, but as I said as well, like the collaboration is a huge issue. Like heat is definitely a problem that, you know, doesn't really have a clear owner um, in most communities right now, right? Um, there's there's no, yeah, you know, there isn't necessarily anyone, even, you know, at the city level, right? Like which department do you go to who ultimately is responsible for addressing heat? Is it emergency management? Is it planning? Um, you know, is it the public health department? it just it isn't really coordinated and so that's actually i think one of the reasons why we are seeing more cities now um that are appointing there's been a few of them that are developing like dedicated heat officer positions um and so i think you know they're really going to be tasked with try, trying to do that right to work with communities um to try and coordinate some of these right now um sort of disparate uh initiatives and and programs and and efforts um so I think that that would be one thing. But yeah, I think when it comes to actually implementing any kind of particular very like local heat uh, intervention, then I think it's always going to be really, really critical to work with the community. I mean, I think there's there's actually been a lot of research uh, that's been done on tree planting um, and, you know, efforts and programs and some of the challenges associated with those. Right. Especially if if they end up just getting sort of dropped into a particular community that has, you know, maybe a long history of um, of underinvestment or, or um, you know, doesn't have a great relationship uh, maybe with, with uh, governments, they've been marginalized in many ways. And so I think, yeah, really being careful with that, working with the community, building trust, um, making sure that the strategies that are being implemented are what the community wants, I think is going to be critical. Um, so, so yeah, I think there, there are different ways of doing that, um, different models for like how you how you go about that, whether you have, you know, community workshops, I know is a sort of process that has been done in um, in Phoenix, where they had a series of workshops with particular communities that had a lot of heat, uh, heat risk and tried to kind of develop a plan with them and then from there go in and implement. But that takes time, right? And it takes, uh, yeah, a lot of resources to actually build that trust and do that. But it's I think it's still crucially important for for any of these things to be successful. Thank you so much, Sarah. And and Peter, I'm going to go to you really quickly here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the of the makeup of your membership at Net Impact, but I wonder uh, what do you see as some of the as I guess the most important piece um, when you're trying to move your membership towards um a certain goal? Is it is it managing expectations? Is it educating stakeholders? Is it, you know, finding appropriate um, uh, organizations to collaborate with? Exactly how do you see, you know, getting the ball rolling in when you're planning something as large scale as this, which I'm assuming many people in your membership are involved with? Oh, yeah, I think you're, uh, you're muted different constituent groups. There's the network of members, which are undergraduate students, graduate students, and young professionals, uh, 160 odd thousand, presently maybe a million, uh, historically going back over 29 years. Uh, and then there are the companies uh, that we work with. And the, you know, the, the challenge is oftentimes, um, is the community in a place and have interests that align up well with business. Like where are where is this intersection between where business wants to go on a narrative and go uh, related to a topic? And, and is our community in the same place? And we're at this awesome time where uh, businesses are taking up the notion that it's good business to do good business. It, it isn't that, that businesses are anthropomorphic prone to human dysfunction. They're recognizing that uh, people are their employees, their communities where they operate, their consumers and their, their shareholders. So it's good business to be reflective. Business is really a mirror. Uh, and, and um, you know, for the pundits that will say um, for the social or, or climate initiatives of business, oh, they're just placating a particular constituent group or or po partisan politics, it, it, it isn't that at all. They are looking at their community and their consumers and saying this matters to them. And so where we have that intersection, 
we have awesome things that we can do to move uh, forward, both for the basis of, you know, a just and sustainable planet, but also nudging business in the right direction. And we are in that place. It's a really interesting time. While there is this dysfunction that I'm talking about, about there's friction right now, we are definitely moving in the right direction. And it could be that some would like business to move quicker, but it, but it is happening. And, and I, so I, you know, that manifests in programs we do. We have a, a forestry program with U.S. Department of Forestry focused on a case competition in Northern California. We have a sustainable fashion program for students that care about that component. We train people in something called Climate Interactive, which is a, an MIT Labs tool uh, that can uh, anoint them climate ambassadors and drive uh, and, and, and help to drive uh, change within organizations to abide by the obligations to stay under uh, planetary temperature rise under 2% over the next 20 years. So there are many programs that we do that are funded by corporate and endowment partners that our community uh, um, get engaged in and the learnings and the KPIs that come from that in order to the benefit of both. Thank you so much, Peter. And again, Ada and Sarah, this has been uh, really fantastic. And I wish we had more time for questions, uh, but we're going to take this opportunity to dive into our next keynote speaker. Our next keynote speaker is Michael Gallus. Michael is the CEO of Gallus and Associates and is the author of Coevolution. He's also nationally rec a nationally recognized planner is the Institute's guru for regional planning and the interface between built and natural systems. Although he's in Charlotte now, he ties to Southern Cal he has ties to Southern California and goes uh, goes back uh, often. So Michael, welcome. And uh, if you're ready to present, you can go ahead and turn on your camera. Let's see. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm standing in for Stephen Jordan, and I want to give him um, full credit. He would have loved to have been here today, but he's not able to. Um, I, it was a pleasure to listen in to the last two presentations with uh, Peter and Sarah, and I caught the end of um, Ada's presentation. Um, if I had to give my presentation, the title, I would use the title of an article I just finished called When the Wolf Arrives, Is There a Meaningful Solution to the Environmental Crisis? And I, I don't refer to it any longer as climate change. Um, in researching for the article, um, I was looking at the conditions in Southern California and I noticed two things. Um, the recent pronouncements by the Metropolitan Water District in Southern California that just a week ago declared a drought emergency, called for water local suppliers to immediately cut the use of water, and used the title that we are now headed for uncharted territory. It's amazing against the backdrop of an article that was published on April 28th in Bloomberg um, that was titled, Facing Drought, Southern California Has More Water Than Ever, quoting a reserve of 3.2 million acre feet that should get Southern California through this year and next. How could it be that we were that wrong that the governor back in April de declared a water emergency for two counties in Northern California, and now we have a statewide water emergency six months later. Thought we were drowning in water, had plenty of water, and now there's no water. How is it that people can run ads about save the polar bears when you can't save a polar bear unless you save the ice? And the examples globally, 106,000 animals, farm animals dying in Chile because of the heat sink in the South Pacific. We're talking here catastrophic environmental change. So where's the response? There is no response. The tepid response is tiny. 
And the other part of the article I wrote about was the contrast with the petroleum industry where I worked for several years with a marketing partner who I ran into because of an article who was former president of Exxon, who gave me the inside story of how that industry works, how dominant it is and its reach across the world. In listening to the presentations today, this confrontation between the global economy and the global environment uh, is the issue of our time. And how do we get out of this? And how can we solve it? It's not just an environmental problem, as it's been mentioned by the previous speaker, especially Peter. It's a social problem. We have a social crisis, the homelessness of our cities, the uh, opioids, the health crisis, an economic crisis in, in employment, and job allocations. It's a political crisis. This country is paralyzed and most of the world is paralyzed. And uh, how do we get out? Well, we have been working, and I love the term next gen, uh, on what I would call next generation cities because it's only by sweeping changes at a macro scale. And individual studies are required at the micro scale, as we've described about heat, about water, flooding, et cetera, which are all facets of a larger confrontation of the human species with itself. So when we think of next generation cities, we got to think about multiple factors. And I'll just leave it at that. We've talked about the social factors. The cities are not working. We have tent cities across this country of homeless, displaced people, largely in my mind coming out of the 2007 recession due to the enormous shift in wealth that took place in the shortest amount of time in US history. In conversations with the chief economist at Wells Fargo Bank, we discussed how 20% of the US population earns 51.25 of the total earned income and 80% share less than half the earned income. And that 20% has 91% of the equity and the 80% shares 9%. They have nothing other than a paycheck. There is no safety net. There's an environmental crisis. And what we're seeing in Southern California now, they're talking about closing off all water for outdoor watering. You're in a desert. What are you going to see in the streets of Southern California with no watering outside? That's only the start of the crisis, let alone what's happening to the herds in the upper Midwest where there's not enough hay to feed the herds and only enough hay to feed a quarter of the herds. What's going to happen to those animals? Just like Chile. We have an energy crisis. And to me, the two biggest things the public involved in and all the other policies, the way we build our infrastructure, wasteful, terrible return on investments, and land utilization. And just turning it into land utilization, water consumption, San Francisco, a denser city, consumes 72 gallons per person a day, LA, 106. It, it, these are unsustainable numbers. We are going to have to combine our studies, individual studies, and individual foundations and develop a bigger vision, a, a new strategy. And we need new measures of performance for public investment and public policy. We, we really don't measure well the performance of our cities socially, economically, uh, and in any system, education, health, et cetera. But, uh, and I really don't think we're going to be good Boy Scouts. You know, the motto was be prepared. You don't want to be out in the woods and find you have no hatchet, no matches, no, you know, no food. You're going to be stuck miles from nowhere. We're in the process of being stuck miles from nowhere, totally unprepared for the crisis to come. What happens when the water crisis and the drought in California and the whole Colorado Basin is to go on for three years and the drought in the upper Midwest where they only have enough hay for a quarter of their herds? 
is predicted to go on for seven more years. How many animals are going to be left? What kind of food are we going to be producing? So at the end of the article, I said, the wolf has arrived. We've heard so many calls about crisis and about problems for so long that people have become inured to this. But the problem is they may be dismissing this. And certainly you heard our previous president call it a hoax. You, you hear on uh, many TV shows that it's all climate change is a shrine and you know all the liberals are worshiping. Well, this crisis is gonna break across us like the attack on Pearl Harbor. And maybe it's gonna take that before we're motivated to really do anything serious. Our previous speaker, Sarah, talked about heat. And where are you going to find somebody? Who's even in charge of that? Who cares about it enough to really take it seriously? So I would say that this crisis is bigger. And it's not just an environmental one. It's across the board. You can't solve one part of this. Unless we bring the formulas together for the economy and energy, the environment, society, we're not going to do it. So I would say that this meeting today is a small meeting in California, but I think it's profound in the ability for us to initiate a conversation that recognizes this potential scale of the wolf that is about to arrive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael, for that uh, very sobering presentation. And I do, um, I do think that you're absolutely right. It is profound. We've got uh, participants uh, on this call, not just uh, attendees, but also speakers that are from all over the country, perhaps some from other parts of the world. So I do want to um, open this up one more time. If anyone has any questions uh, for any of our speakers, Sarah, Ada, Peter, and Michael. And uh, Peter, Peter just dropped a, a quote in the chat. Winston Churchill said, Americans will always do the right thing only after they've tried everything else. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, and I don't, I don't necessarily think that that is reserved just for us over here. I can, I can definitely <laughs> say that that's the case for, for many others around the world. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. So I, I wanted to see if, uh, Peter, you had any response to uh, to Michael's, uh, what Michael shared at all. I totally agree with everything that he said. And, you know, our um, organization a year ago framed our work through the lens reimagining capitalism during pandemic. Uh, we led with... Uh, with Rebecca Henderson, who wrote a book by that title uh, to kick off a virtual series uh, that we did on the topic. And um, it was an awesome event. And coming into this year, many friends of Net Impact asked us not to squander the opportunity. So think about what you've done and, and, and where the conversation should go next. And we said, OK, well, let's reimagine capitalism. It's a regenerative one that's for people and planet. And I think Michael's point about how it is so apparent that climate is an existential threat that requires being dealt with, you know, as the as my colleagues on the prior part of this conversation really focused on elements that impacted uh, people by virtue of heat or, or by virtue of, uh, you know, water and control in the levees. Um, we need to also get past the idea of doomism. Doomism is, is the current form of denial. Once it was the climate change doesn't exist and the climate denial denialists will now embrace doomism and say, oh, it's too late. Well, the answer isn't really to shoot silicon into space to create a, a seal for the for the planet. That's not the answer. The answer is, is to do everything we can. There is a, a, a colleague of mine here in Brooklyn, Ayana Johnson, who wrote a book 
called All We Can Save. And I think that's a really important point is not to necessarily bemoan all that's lost, but let's think about all that we can save. Thank you so much, Peter. And we are going to wrap up this session. If you want to uh, log off and go head on over to tech discussion number two, that is getting started on the other link. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody.